You already know what time it is. This is Unfiltered. I'm Mike Ginn. Of course, Unfiltered is brought to you on the Fighters First Network. Make sure you click that like button and subscribe. And then head on over to fightersfirst.shop so we can pay the bills, uh, get all the officially licensed collections of some of your favorite fighters, uh, fightersfirst.shop. But that's the business side of things. My uh, guest this episode is an up-and-coming fighter who has a really crazy tale to tell. Uh, He was on the rise and then kind of stepped away from the sport for a little bit. Uh, He's back now, ready to compete, so we'll talk to him about that. Uh, he also has some uh, interesting things from his childhood to talk about as well. So we'll get to that. Uh, I'm talking about Justin uh, Muslia, uh, a.k.a. The Moose. Uh, Justin, thanks for taking some time today, buddy. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Absolutely. For- uh, you know, I've I followed you quite a bit. Uh, of course, you train with Tiger Schulman's. Uh, our good friend Brandon Catino uh, talks highly about you. Uh, you were one of his fellow like kickboxers and stuff in there that you don't see too many of. A lot of MMA guys. You, of course, have also done some MMA as well. Uh, you were doing quite a bit of it right before you kind of stepped away suddenly uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, we'll get to your journey of what got you to that point, but let's just kind of get the uh, elephant in the room. Why did you step away last February? Um, oof. It was uh, it was a pretty tough ride, tough journey. Um, 2020 obviously kind of screwed everybody over um, as far as COVID went, uh, but it kind of hit me pretty hard in the beginning of the year. Uh, I ended up breaking my nose right before, about a week before um, I was supposed to fight ring combat. And um, so obviously, for obvious reasons, I, I had to pull out of that fight. Then finally I healed up, decided that uh, I was going to take another fight. And about my first week into fight camp, I ended up uh, tearing my calf pretty bad. Um, so that happened and then healed that up. Uh, then I ended up getting another fight and I ended up not being able to fight because my opponent got COVID. Then finally, so that's, that's officially what happened to Escanero. He got COVID. Yeah. So the first time. Okay. I believe. Cause I know uh, they said he was sick, but I don't know if I'd ever heard exactly that he had had a COVID. Well, the second, the fourth, the third, I'm sorry, what was it? I was supposed to fight four times. How many times? <laughs> the, fourth, the fourth time, then we were supposed to fight again. Um, and then I ended up, a week before the fight, I ended up breaking my jaw. That Friday was my last sparring session. And then uh, that night I found out that Escarano got COVID. So I think I might be mixing it up. I think the fight before that, I was supposed to fight. Somebody else got sick. but um, And, of course, we're talking about what was supposed to be your pro debut with uh, Cage yeah. Fury fighting championship. Every every single one of those fights, yeah. So uh, I broke my jaw right before Thanksgiving, um, and I was distraught. I had four injuries or three injuries in the year, and I, I kind of was like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I made, a, made a glass or something. And I decided I uh, wanted to step away and focus on focus on some other things. Um, but that was definitely a regret of mine, and that's why I'm back now. So, uh, kind of kind of like the Andrew Luck tale for people like following football, how he had injury after injury and didn't want to rehab no more. Right. He, he was like, I wanted to enjoy my life. I wanted to like stop uh, having to rehab every five seconds. Yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty bad because you know that's four paychecks that, that I missed out on, four fight camps, and you know putting my body through hell, and then. It kind of took a mental toll on me, and I decided, you know, maybe maybe this isn't for me. But uh, yeah, we we talk about that a lot on uh, our other show, Art of MMA. Me and Brandon about fighter pay and stuff like that, and how a lot of jo- a lot of guys, especially on the regional scene, you know, y'all got real jobs. <laughs> you have yeah. like nine to five day jobs, and you're you're training when you can, trying to fight when you can, trying to uh, you know get to that dream of you know living off fighting a hundred percent, whether it's the UFC or Bellator or PFL or wherever. And it's a hard journey. It's a really hard journey for a lot of guys. Um, but what led you back? Because now, like the last, I guess, about eight months later, you started training again. You started showing up at Tiger Showman's. Everybody was kind of surprised to see you back. Like, they're like, wait, wait, what's he what's he doing here? What, what led you back? Um, so I ended up getting a uh, – I ended up – so I used to teach at Tiger Showman's. I ended up stepping away uh, from that as well. I kind of stepped away from martial arts as a whole. For, for quite some time, I ended up getting a job with the – uh, elevator company so I started working on elevators um, and it I ended up being with somebody that had COVID um, I tested I came up negative and my boss was like look you, you got you can't come in you know this is just for safety reasons so you know take the week off 
And I was like, okay. So I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll maybe I'll show face. It's been a while. <laughs> I've been eating like a got phone. I've been I've been not doing anything. Uh, let me show face. So I went in and uh, everyone was super surprised and. I missed it, man. Like I missed it. I missed sparring. I missed getting punched in the face. I missed every aspect of it. It's just something that I love, right? So I went in and uh, Leo, uh, the executioner. I don't know if you know him. Um, he was there. It was the first time I met him, and he was about a week out from uh, from fighting for uh, combates. And uh, Tiger was like, you know, you want to spar? So I was, I was like. Do I want to spar? Yeah, of course I want to freaking spar. Let's go. Let's get in there. So uh, I put my gloves on. Uh, Shane Garza came on, stepped in the cage. Um, like riding a bike? Yeah, man. I sparred with Leo, and I felt good. You know, for being out for a whole entire year, I felt real good. I was moving around, and, and you know, we were, we were going at it. And I was like, man, this is great. Then I find out that he was supposed to, that he was fighting in a week, right? This was his last sparring session. So, you know, this is when they're in their tip-top performing shape. Yeah, and I'm like, I was, I was hanging, man. Like, I was, I felt good, and I was like, you know what? I'm too good for this. I, I'm too good for for not for not fighting. I'm too good to to quit. Like, why am I gonna do this? I told all my students, you know, keep going, never quit on your dreams, never quit on things like this. And so I had the, I made the push, and I made some adjustments with with work, and I decided that uh, I was gonna get back to it and figure out my training schedule which is pretty tough in the beginning, but I think everybody sometimes needs that mental break though. Like if you've done something long enough, like for instance, I bartended for a, a number of years, over 20 years. And there was a time period where I took like two years off because it just, you know, you get burnt out of doing the same thing all the time. And then you're dealing with the injuries. You're dealing with everything. I did martial arts for a number of years. And sometimes I would step away from that and come back a couple times, a couple years later, just like you did, obviously not on the same level right. <laughs> as what you're doing, but you know, that, I think in any walk of life, I think sometimes, and you know, we talk about mental health way more today than we ever did, you know, 15, 20 years ago, but that's a big thing. Like, you know, you got to take care of you before you can be the best version of you. Yeah. And sometimes that, that stepping away can, can be even better because now you're the comeback is even stronger, even harder. You're healthy. You're not beat up from all the injuries you got, you got your mental game and you got the passion back. Right. Yeah, man. I mean, I tell, I tell everybody, Tell all my coaches, I'm like, this is the most motivated I've ever been in my entire life. Um, uh, this is something that I really want. And I told them, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna make a serious push for the UFC. And I'm gonna get in there. Uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to take as many fights as I can, and I'm just gonna get in there and, and get to work. So, so let, let's talk. Let, let, so we got that out of the way. Let, let's go back and talk about this journey a little bit. How does how does a kid from Toronto hmm. go from being a member of a boy band? I mean, right? Like fifth floor boy band. Yep. Did you research? That's good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, hey, look, professional here, buddy. Professional. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, nah, I mean, I did. I looked it up. I saw the Teen Choice Awards video of y'all singing. I saw a couple other little things you have on YouTube. Uh, saw uh, your cousin hyping you up and, and a bunch of other people. Uh, yeah, no doubt. Uh, but how do you go from, and you're still, first of all, I do want to talk about this later in the episode. You're still very heavily into music. Like, that's your thing. Like, you love right. singing, you love being in music. Got your own little carpool karaoke's you be doing your little TikTok mixes, but you do love music like that's that's still one of your first loves, right? Yeah, it's it's still one of my loves, man. I, you know, every time I get in the car, I'm by, by myself. That music's blaring, and I'm I'm singing out loud. You know, I don't care if anybody's watching. I can a car can pull up next to me. I'll be belting out eyes closed at a red light, and they'll be staring. <laughs> I'll give a nice little wave. How you doing? <laughs> I don't even know if anybody's shocked anymore in the TikTok era. For real. Uh, like, you, you're, like I've been in parking lots and I've seen like girls doing like an entire TikTok dance right outside their car. And I'm yeah. just like, whatever. <laughs> it's like, I'm sure it'll pop up some point in my timeline later. It's okay. <laughs> whatever. Um, but yeah, you, you had your time with, well, for, actually, let me just start with that. What led you to like joining a boy band and singing with these friends of yours that you grew up with was fifth floor, like what y'all lived on? Like, where did all that come from? No. Nah, so, um, I was, you know, I'm half Filipino. Right. And, uh, in my family, music and 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 talents, I should say, are very very big. And um, a lot of my cousins and family members can sing. So I've been singing since I was a kid. Uh, every every family reunion that we have, we have this little you know concert that we have that that we would throw all the kids up there, or even adults up there, and they'd show off their talents. And most of them is just singing. 
<clears throat> so um, I, I started singing more and more, and my mom was like, man, you're really good. You should try to pursue this. So I auditioned for American Idol. I auditioned for a bunch of other things, and then I auditioned for this this boy band. So I had no idea who any of these kids were. Okay. Um, so I went to the audition. I ended up getting in. They put five of us together, and uh, we ended up going and 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 doing pretty well. We recorded a crap ton of songs. We were talking to a bunch of record labels. Um, we signed a couple things and um did the album ever come out? No, no, it did not. We ended up getting kind of shelved. Um it, it was a that was a sticky situation um with the band when I left. Um I left right before things started getting even crazier. I mean we went to the Teen Choice Awards, we we went the, we were on tour and it was it was it was awesome while I was there you know how old were you when that was going on like 16 17 18 it was oh, it was okay. like of that time I was pretty young um but for a 16 year old kid that's like time of your life touring around getting paid for it yeah it was it was pretty it was pretty interesting you know <laughs> it was uh we we would go around and I like how your mind's wondering of like can I tell this story? <laughs> no, it's not even can I tell the story. It's just like there's so many stories, you know. Uh, <clears throat> we would we would just it was a good time, man. It was like it was like one of those things where I would never go back and 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 change anything, you know. Uh, yeah. The band was they were they're all cool dudes. I don't really talk to any to any of them anymore. I actually talked to maybe one of them. He ended up like joining some K-pop band and and. And uh, made it pretty big over there on that side, and uh, I think they broke up, and he came back this way. And now he's just like big time influencer. But <clears throat> so I don't really talk to any of those guys anymore. Um, do the, do they do they like were they all from like Canadian or from Jersey no, or? No, they're all from like New Jersey, New York. New um, York, so okay. I was born in Canada. I moved yeah. here to the states when I was like five or six. Okay, whole entire family is out there, so. Um, everything, everything that I've done is, is, is on this land. So what, what age did you start finally? Like, like what, what age did you start training in like mixed martial arts, whether it was karate or anything else like that? Dude, is that started, something you did from a little kid? Oh man. That's, that's why it's, it's pretty crazy. Late bloomer. Yeah. I'm a late bloomer. I started when I was, uh, 20, I was 20, 19, 20 years old when I started. So right after the music is when you decided to like try this out. Yeah, man. I mean, I was, I was, uh, don't let the uh, boy band stuff fool you. I was a I was a real bad kid. I was I was a real bad kid, and I was getting myself into a lot of trouble. And uh, martial arts was my outlet. You know, I got I got into a really screwed up situation when I was nineteen. I had just turned nineteen, um, and uh, not many people know the story. So this might be um, this Should might I be put one. the exclusive tag out. <laughs> yeah, the exclusive tag. Um, so I turned eighteen. Um, and I ended up getting into a, uh, getting a phone call from a buddy of mine. He was telling me that, uh, you know, this kid that I had beef with wanted to fight, you know, this is what I love to do. Like from a kid, I would, I would be, I would try to fight all the time. And this is why I kind of led into this direction. Right. I was always getting into trouble for fighting in school, getting trouble for fighting on the street, like wherever the heck it was, I wanted to throw hands. That's just how it was. Um, and I, I partially think it was like a lack of lack of confidence at that point. Um, believe it or not, just just wanting to prove myself to everybody because <clears throat> um, I was a small little, small little scrawny Filipino Albanian kid. You know, uh, Napoleon had, complex, little yeah, mini complex, yeah, a lot of complex in me. So, um, getting a phone call from a buddy of mine, he was like, "Yo, this kid wants to fight you." You know, I always had beef with him in high school. He came back from uh, basic training in the Marines, and I was like. I was like, all right, let's go. So I ended up going. I ended up, you know, getting, getting into a fight with him and, and beating him up pretty bad, um, real bad, enough for his mom to end up pressing charges. Um, a week later, I ended up moving to a different house. You know, I'm an 18-year-old kid. I don't decide to change my license, um, my address on my license. So all the uh, the arrest warrants were getting sent to my old house. Old address, yeah. Um, a year goes by. You can walk down the stairs. It's all right. You can make noise. Um, a year goes by, and I ended up going to Canada, visiting family. Don't worry. It wouldn't be an episode of Unfiltered if somebody didn't make a cameo. It's cool. Yeah, yeah it's all right. <laughs> I ended up going to um, 
Canada, coming back from Canada, um, I was visiting family. I was at the border. Um, border officer was like, you know what? You need to put your keys on top of the car, put both hands on the wheel, and I'm sitting there. I'm like, what the hell's going on? I'm like, I, you know, probably young. She probably think there's drugs in the car or something. Next thing you know, I'm face first on the ground. Um, hands behind my back and handcuffs thrown on me. I'm like, what the hell is going on right now? 19 year old kid at this point i'm like i have no idea what the fuck is going on they end up putting me into to a holding cell i asked the cop i'm like i'm like what the hell did i do and it was like a scene out of a movie i'm like what did i do They're like you know exactly what you did and i'm like i had no clue zero clue whatsoever um so i'm in holding uh then they ended up sending me to niagara county jail and that's when I finally spoke to my lawyer and my lawyer was like, okay, um, you know, you have assault charges pressed against you. You got a warrant for your arrest. So you're a wanted fugitive for fleeing the country. And I'm like 19 year old kid. My stomach's freaking turning, dude. And I'm like, I'm like freaking- I was just going to visit friends. So like, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, yeah, like I went, to, I was up there visiting family, friends, and like my stomach is turning. I have no idea what the fuck's going on. Um, I ended up spending like five months in Niagara County jail. Wow. Uh, yeah, waiting to get extradited. I finally get got released on my own recognizance um, because my lawyer ended up saying, like, he had no idea. You know, he moved. He didn't change his license. Technically my fault. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, man, and after that experience, being in there five months, you know, 19-year-old kid. What, what ended up happening with the uh, charges? Um, yeah, I ended up getting uh, aggravated assault charges. Um, Did they just credit it time served? They credited time served. Yeah, I ended up uh, getting the pleading guilty for it and taking a plea that uh, it was a year probation and I would take the aggravated assault charge. Um, so that kind of fucked me up um, mentally for for a while. And right as soon as I got out, I was like, you know, what? I need to do something with this because if I if I don't do something with my life, I'm probably gonna end up dead or back in jail. Right. So. Yeah. I was getting involved with the wrong people, doing doing drugs, getting into fights. Like it was just, I was robbing people. It was it was bad, man. Um, so martial arts saved my life. I ended up going to a party and meeting, uh, saying I was sitting there and I saw some kid, some tiny you know tiny little kid sitting there watching watching himself fight. Mind you, it was pretty funny. I'm, I'm sitting there. I was like, Who the "Fuck is this kid?" I walk up to him and I start talking to him. He was like, "Hey, I'm Jimmy." I ended up being Jimmy Rivera. <clears throat> Um, and I was like, what are you watching? He was like, oh, this is my last fight. Everybody didn't see it. And this is when he was back fighting in uh, ring combat. Okay. So I was like, I was like, where are you trained? He was like, Tiger Shulman. So I was like, Tiger Shulman. So is this like around 2012, 2013? Yeah, about that time. Yeah. I, know we, I know we interviewed him back when we were doing like print interviews and stuff. Like we interviewed him maybe right after he did it, or he's about to make his Bellator debut. But it was like right around the ring of combat time. Yeah, yeah, it was still running in combat, so it might have been like 2012. 2013. Yeah. Um, it's been a long time. Um, I can't even go back that far anymore. I've been hitting the head too much. <clears throat> and uh, I ended up meeting him, and I was like, he was like, where are you? I asked him, where are you trained? He's like, Tiger Showman's. I was like, Tiger Showman's? I was like, the fuck? Isn't that like a karate school? I'm like, you know, 1 800 Tiger Showman's. <laughs> no, we have a fight team. And I was like, I'll get the fuck oh. out of here. Um, so he was like, yeah, so we talked a little bit, and he was like, you should go train. Right away, I was like, you know what? I'm like, next day, I called up, called up uh, Ramsey Tiger Shulman's, uh, spoke to Sensei Rapport, and uh, went in, took my first class, and man, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with it immediately, so that's... Uh, Anybody from that first class that is still around? First class is in, like... Like, training like when you first jumped in that gym and the first like training classes you were with, is there anybody like, cause Brandon tells me the story. Like sometimes like when he first started, like he, he like some of those people that were still there, like are still there, like, yeah. like right from the very beginning. Cause a lot of people that joined tigers, it, it, they're there for life. Like they just don't like, they just fall in love with it. Just like you. Yeah. Is there anybody that you still like from that very beginning that are still around that you see? Yeah. One of my best friends, Mike Trezana. Okay. So Mike was part of that. Was he already there or was he joining like you were joining? No, nah, he was already there. Okay. Um, and let me tell you, man, it's the funniest story. Mike, uh, I started training with him and, you know, he was already kind of training with the fight team already. It was a yellow belt at the time. Okay. Uh, 
when I went in there, you know, I'm a hot-headed kid. I get into fights all the time. I, I tell Sensei Rapport, I'm like, I want to fight, blah, blah, blah. This is what I like to do. And he was like, all right, let's throw a little test on there. So uh, Mike ended up, Sensei ended up telling him, you know, go and, uh, go and, go and humble this kid up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And Mike was training with the fight team. I didn't really have any good experience. All I got is fight experience and on the street. Yeah. You know. You don't have no technique or anything like that. Yeah, it's just straight up, just straight up, I like to fight, yeah. Closing my eyes and swinging away, hoping to land a good shot. Um, and I ended up sparring with Mike. And all I remember is Mike just pinning me up against the wall and just, bah, just beating the shit out of me. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I'm like, I immediately humbled me up. Immediately. Like, didn't. It's like, if this kid comes that, back after this, we know we got something with him. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I was like, all right. Humbled me up and fell in love with it. Started training, took a little break. Uh, I disappeared for a little while, and then I ended up coming back, and then it was just fucking, we took off. So so was the plan always, because you did a lot of kickboxing early. Was the plan always to transition to MMA, or was it you was kickboxing what you wanted to kind of stick with in the beginning? No, it was always to go to MMA. So at the time, um, Tiger and uh, and Sean Ron Shulman, they um, – they had this whole uh, philosophy and this formula, right? You know, they wanted certain people like, okay, you guys are going to kickbox. You're going to get your hands right. You're going to make sure that you're comfortable in a ring and you're going to go do Nagas. Um, I ended up having, man, like, I want to say like 15 kickboxing fights, 16 kickboxing fights. Oh, no, even more than that. I think it was like 18 kickboxing fights. I got to go back and look at it. It's, so, it's been so long. Um, and uh, a bunch of Nagas, and then once... You only lost, like, once or twice, right? Yeah, I, only, I lost twice. I lost twice. twice. Yeah. Um, lost to Yorick Anderson and then Jamie Mendoza. Uh, and then I had a draw. But That tells you how many wins you have when, when you can just spit off the names of the ones you lost. Yeah, yeah. It also tells you, like, the kind of drive you got and the kind of person you are, because, like, it's like that one, that one, that, God damn, I'm going to get that dude. Like one day, I'm gonna get that, <laughs> yeah. like that one, and that just tells you like the kind of like successful drive that you have, because when you're sitting there and you're telling this story from 10 years ago, <laughs> you know, you're like that guy, that guy right there. I remember him. Yep. It was, it was like my second kickboxing fight, Jamie Mendoza. And I lost because I got tired and decided, you know what, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I ain't losing again. I ended up making a serious push, won two titles, didn't lose a single fight, and then I fought Yorick Anderson, and that kid can fight. I ended up, I ended up being cool, like cool with Yorick. Me and him. Yeah, that video was actually on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, they, that that fight, that was one of my favorite fights. That was actually my last kickboxing fight before I transitioned to MMA. I was like, I looked at Tiger, I was like, Sean, I'm done kickboxing. Like, I want to take somebody down. <laughs> like, I need small gloves, and I want to be able to do everything. I, I can't take this kickboxing stuff no more. Uh, but going back to, to that, there was like a formula that he wanted that we, we wanted to have MMA fighters kickbox professionally and then, and then win Nagas and, and be able to, to win the intermediate expert division in Nagas so that we know that we're going to the ground. And then when they say that you're ready, we go and kickbox or we go and do an MMA. That formula is a little different now. I'm a little sad about that. There's some people who only had a couple, you know, like three, four kickboxing fights and then like a Naga and now they're fighting MMA. Kind of makes me sad because I could. It was kind of the same story that Brandon had too about the beginning days. He was like uh, how everybody just thought it was a karate school because that's kind of what they started off as. And then they transitioned into the MMA. They transitioned into all these other things, you know, the Jimmy Rivera's, the Mike Trezano's, the Shane Burgos's. Today you got the Solomon Renfro's and, and a bunch of other guys, including yourself, that are like knocking on the door. Um, and that formula, you know, like you said, they might have shortened it up because there is so much focus on MMA nowadays than there is kickboxing. There's a, you know, I mean, I'm sure for the school, there's a lot of money in it for MMA. A lot of kids are coming to the school saying, hey, I want to train MMA. They don't have the patience, like the patience, right? That's a big deal. Like you come into martial arts, and I can tell you firsthand, like I started off um doing taekwondo like when i was a little kid and kind of like the same thing like i i constantly grew up in i grew up in a bad area outside dc like mm-hmm. i was constantly in and around a bunch of stuff and between sports and martial arts it kind of kept my head saying kept me from getting into trouble that you got into because i could go to you know 
a tournament and let out everything that I had built up for the last three or four months. And I don't get me wrong. I got my fair share of uh, little scuffles at, at school and around the streets and stuff like that. You know, it just comes with where you grow up. Yeah. But that kept, kept my head on my shoulders for a long time. And I eventually went on to Hokkaido and some other things. And you kind of transition. Now, I wish MMA existed when I was a kid. I'm way older than you. I'm almost 45. Like, I wish when I was a kid growing up, especially in the late 80s and 90s, like, that that was a thing. Like, towards the 90s, we started getting, like, the tough man competitions and stuff you'd see. And you'd start seeing, like, UFC 1 and UFC 2, like, kind of popping up on pay-per-view that you weren't supposed to watch. Yeah, yeah. Like, don't like you don't watch that. You don't watch that. And they're like, we go sneak over a friend's house and we pull our little, like, everybody put $5 in and we, like, we get the pay-per-view. And then only to get their parents to, like, rip their head off because of, of the, what is this on my bill? What is this on my bill? Um. So then we started throwing an extra $5 in there so they wouldn't complain about us ordering it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that transition, like, that's a big part of your learning experience. And now you're such a more well-rounded striker. And the funny thing is the reason why I bring that up is because that's not how you've been finishing your fights. Like, mm. when you were in your M M amateur MMA, if I could talk right, you were doing a lot of guillotine chokes. Like, that was your thing. Like, you would get somebody stuck in that guillotine and it was lights out. It, is that like your go-to or is that just kind of how the fight transitioned? No, I mean, like, <clears throat> I, obviously I'd like, I'd love to keep it on the feet all the time, but you know, people, people take stupid takedowns and go in on things. And the, the guillotine is my choke. Like once I get that in on there, I was, uh, I, I finish it. Um, you know, everybody at headquarters was calling me the Philippine guillotine for a little <laughs> while. I was finishing everybody with them. You know, that's that's my go-to. So uh, somebody tries to take me down, their neck is exposed, I'm grabbing that shit. I think Moose is a much easier nickname to say. Percent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe we can throw a Philippine guillotine on, on, a, on a T-shirt for you. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but I think Moose is much easier. 100%. Uh, <laughs> so so you transition to MMA. You, you're starting to get some of these MMA fights. Uh did you kind of develop more passion from that? Like, was that like you were like, you felt like you were finally home? Uh, yeah, man. My first fight, like if you go back and watch my first MMA fight against, uh, the heck is his name? Andre Miller. It was with, uh, aggressive combat. Um, the second I get, got in that cage, you know, like all of my kickboxing fights, I was like, I would walk to the ring. I would be, you know, stone, stone faced. I would be cold. I'd walk in there, just try to be super intimidating. Um, I, I remember going to the weigh-ins. Finally, for being able to get the okay to fight in MMA, I went to the weigh-ins, and here he is getting in my face, all stone-faced like I usually am, and I'm sitting there smiling. I was like, <laughs> I I finally made it. Um, and then I went into the cage, and like as soon as I got in the cage, it was like I was relaxed because I was like, dude, I'm home. This is where I need to be. This is like this is finally like I, I finally get to to punch somebody in the face, kick somebody in the face, take them down to the ground punch them on the ground, submit them. I can do whatever I want. It's freedom. Like it, it felt so free. Um, so once I, once I was able to get in the cage, man, like that was just, it was, it was, it was a good feeling. My first fight, man. Um, so, yeah. Cause I mean, honestly, like the close MMA is the closest thing to street fighting you can get legally. Right. Okay. Like, you know, in a fight on the street, anything goes like if somebody takes you down, grabs you, smothers you, chokes you, whatever. Like yep. MMA is like the same thing with rules. And, I can only imagine going through the kickboxing time. It, it made you obviously a way better striker, right. but you got had handcuffs on, right? You had to be disciplined. You you couldn't do like this guy. This guy's doing this, man. I, man, imagine if I just grabbed his neck right now. Like yeah. you couldn't do that. Yeah, exactly. So I, I can only imagine the freedom of finally doing that. And you had what like six, seven amateur MMA fights, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like five and two or something like that. Five, uh, six and one. Uh, six and one. Six and one. Yeah. Six and one. Sorry. You know, tapology isn't always right. Yeah, no, it's never right. They said I finished an armbar, and I was like, I didn't finish an armbar. It was all guillotines. <laughs> yeah, I, I sat there and saw that, and I watched the video. I was like, what armbar? Yeah, yeah. Because was... you, you came up in the YouTube era, right? Like, a lot of your fights, especially the amateur ones, are all on YouTube. Like, you uh -huh. sit there and watch almost all of them from start to finish. Yeah. Uh, every one of these promotions are putting their, their videos out there to, to enhance their promotion, obviously. But, you know, mm. here is this kid. And you were sitting there, like, d destroying everybody, going through everybody. You know, then you had all the injuries hit. You had Efren Escanero, Escanero uh, scheduled for a number of times. You were supposed to do the pro uh, fight. You took the time off. 
and then came back as we talked about you had your passion back you had your fire back yeah are there plans now for you to finally get back in that cage and do what you were supposed to do yes absolutely 100 percent. i am going to make a serious push to the ufc um i was supposed to fight either may 20th or may 27th you know i wanted to give myself ample time of training to make sure that i get my my cardio up and my I get back into shape because man i was not in shape whatsoever during that hiatus now you bounced around a couple of different divisions. They were from 147 up to 155. Yep, like, yep. where are you trying to fight? Featherweight, I, lightweight. I, as far as MMA goes, pro, my, my professional uh, fighting, I'm I'm fighting 135. I'm bantamweight. Going down to bantamweight, okay. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure my weight was good and give myself ample time before I took a fight. Finally, I felt comfortable enough to take one. Um, I gave my coaches uh, a date. I wanted May. I was supposed to fight May 20th and or May 27th and, you know, rain combat or CFFC. And uh, they, we couldn't get any, anybody. Um, we weren't getting anybody and I uh, ended up getting hired with a, with a pretty good company um, and decided, you know, I, I, my first start date is on May 9th. It would have been 10 days before May 20th or you know, two weeks before the 27th, I was like, you know what, let me focus on this job real quick. Let me just get comfortable. Let me see what my hours are going to be like so I can start working around my training schedule again. And uh, so I'm hoping to fight June. And once I step in there, once I get that that fight, it's just going to be a sprint, a sprint towards that, that UFC contract. So l- let me, I kind of call this a real life question because, you know, we talk about the sport so much, but let me ask you a real life question. So you're sitting there, getting ready for these fights, right? And in this case, you're going down to Bantam Weights, which I'm sure there's a, more of a weight cut involved. Mm-hmm. And you, like you say, you worked on elevators, you do a lot of stuff with your hands, and you're doing a lot of these real-world jobs. How does that weight cut affect, like, 10 days out of a fight, you're probably getting drained, you're getting, you know, you're training as hard as you can. How does that affect, like, a job? Because, you know, a lot of these regional guys we talked about, you know, you're on the rise up, you want to be in the UFC. But to get there, you still got to keep the lights on. You still got to pay the bills. Hmm. How does going through like a weight cut affect a job? Um, so this was actually the first time that I was kind of dealing with that, uh, cutting the weight, trying to get my weight down. Um, it was it was tough, you know. I'd be I worked elevator construction things like that, so it was pretty pretty tough. I was walking upstairs doing things. It was pretty draining and. Um, it was it was tough. I ha- I, I'm lucky to have uh, a sponsorship. I made meals. Um, they they send me my meals. I get to to just grab those things, and I'll be I'll be eating my my food uh, at work. It gets mentally tough because you know sometimes I'm not really focused at work because of the because of the wake up. But <clears throat> it it gets done. Look, if if there's a will, there's a way. Um, and this is what I'm like, like mental warfare. Yeah, this is this is what I want to do. So it's all about that mental toughness aspect of it, you know. Like, I yeah, I was always curious about that because I mean, I can only imagine, you know, especially like you know, you're trying to make it to the UFC, obviously, and you're trying to be a guy who does this 100 percent for a living, gets paid to do it well, you know. But in that process, you know, there's a lot of hardship that goes along with these fighters and yourself included that are going up to that level, whether it's the Cage Fury Fighting Championship and selfishly. I hope you get put on one of these Tampa cards so I can go watch you fight. Yeah. Uh, that's in my backyard. But and I keep telling Rob I'm gonna show up at one of these events. But between COVID and everything else going on in the world, I have like you've done a couple cards here, including the hundred one. I couldn't make it to because they didn't have any press available because that was when COVID was spiking again. Yep. And like and I'm looking forward to really getting in and watching one of these Cage Fury Championship cards because uh, we've covered them for a very long time. Yeah. Um, so I, I would really hope if you get a put on one of these Tampa cards, so I could see you fight in person. But yeah, I've always kind of been curious about, you know, some of these hardships that you deal with in order to live your passion, because I've never done it on that level. I, I did it close to that level on baseball, but it was never like MMA What some of you guys go through you, Brandon, Jimmy, Mike, Shane, like I said, all these number of guys, especially the ones that have already gotten to the UFC, uh, that have gone through to get where they're at now. Now I talked to Solomon. We had a really good uh, interview. He was telling me about a lot of the stuff's going from Buffalo to New York and, and to where he is now. Um, as you're training for some of these fights. Um, and now that you're like in, entrenched into the fight team years later now, uh, 
do you still spar with people like Mike? And do you still spar with some of the other guys that are already there? Um, yeah, yes and no. Like right now it's tough because, you know, they train in the mornings. Yeah. When you're working. When I'm working. So anytime that I have a day off, I'm making sure that I'm there. Um, I do see some of the other guys later at night. Um, I don't, so I, I train at Tiger Shulman's, that's my home base, but I also go to uh, Rich Van Hoon over at the UFC gym in Hoboken, um, and I train with him. Um, and I'll be training with kids like Santo, Kiritolo. Um, I train with, obviously, Solomon at night. There's there's a bunch of good heads, Leo. Uh, I train with a lot of good professional guys at night, different different looks. Um, but, yeah, I, I get to spar those guys every once in a while. Like uh, the other day, I, I worked with a – Another up and coming fighter from Tiger Shulman's Christian McCauley. Uh, okay. so I ended up sparring. Um, who else did I work with that day? I mean, regardless of the, the fact that, yeah, every once in a while I'll be able to. It just sucks because I'd, I'd love to be able to work with our guys all the time, but you got you to gotta pay the bills. You know what I'm saying? And right now my skills ain't paying the bills, so I have to actually get a, get a real job and, and work. Luckily, this new job I got now is going to give me a little bit more time and, you know, more more cushion to be able to do that. So Trust me, you don't got to tell me about it. 24-7, right? Like, if yeah. I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, I'm not running the clothing line, I'm out working, I'm out hustling, I'm out doing different stuff. So, you know, the bills have to be paid. And that's, that's like I said, that's the hardship of being an up-and-coming fighter is that you don't have that guaranteed contract. You don't have the guaranteed fight deal. You don't have, you know, I'm going to fight three times a year, and it's going to get paid. And that's what you're fighting for to get to that level. Um, and we're all excited to see you back in the cage. A uh, couple quick questions before I let you get out of here. Uh, what do you think the rest of your year is going to look like as far as, like you said, you're trying to fight in June. Are you trying to fight maybe like a couple times this year? Are you trying to get three fights? What are you trying to do? Yeah, I mean, God willing, uh, I'm trying, if I, you know, injuries, injuries out of the, the fact there, I'm trying to at least fight two, three times before the end of the year. Um, try to see june try to take a fight in june see how i feel after that maybe just take one a couple weeks later and i'll keep my weight down see how it goes but i'm making a serious push so trying to get maybe three three fights this year cool That's what here's and like. you spoke of some of the, the the guys that you had trouble with when you were uh coming up you know the, the mendoza and all the other places what was your toughest opponent? Like, who, who? what fight do you, like, look back on and be like, that was, like, my biggest challenge, whether it was kickboxing or MMA? Um, to be honest with you, I think it might have been uh, – I think it had to have been York. York Anderson, a lost split decision. It was a Friday night fight. Um, he was a little bit bigger than me. And uh, kick and throw. He could throw hands. He could he can kick. He was kicking me from all over the freaking place. The kid side kicked me in the face. I don't know how many times. Um, you know, it was like. You took Taekwondo. You know how to block that. <laughs> yeah. And like, the, I just was, I was getting, I was getting smacked with his foot like every two seconds. You ever seen uh, Don't Mess With the Zohan? Where he was yeah. like, foot, my foot. That's what it felt like. Yeah. Adam Sandler movie, yeah. Every two seconds. Yeah. Um, so I think that was my toughest fight. That doesn't say you're a New York, New Jersey guy right there. <laughs> you brought up Zohan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, was, I love that movie, man. Um, that was my toughest fight just specifically because, you know, he wouldn't go down. I hit him with a I, – I rocked him. And he he was stumbled and he was moving around. And, you know, it ended up losing split decision. Uh, he was we, – we went to war. That was one of my favorite fights too. Uh, my toughest fight, my most favorite fight. Um, I think. And looking uh, for and looking forward, if you had a guy, because obviously you're talking about the top of the food chain in the bantamweight division. You're talking about Aljamain Sterling. You're talking about a returning Henry Cejudo. You're talking about T.J. Dillashaw, Peter Yan. Obviously, Be Bellator has their tournament going on with uh, Rufion Stotts and, and Juan Archuleta, and a guy in your backyard, Patchy Mix, uh, right up there in Buffalo. Um, who do you think you kind of match up well with, and, and what are some of those fights that you're looking forward to to matching up with in the future? That's hard to say, man, because you know I, I got a long ways to go, um, and I want to be able to to get up there, and you know I can only get better from here. So I can't really, you know, look. I, I know people. That's a far. Like, that's a far cry from the answer Solomon gave me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Solomon's a little. Solomon's a little, little closer to that that fact of you know fact. But he's also a. Uh, He's also a lot more, uh, let's just say, amped up. Uh, yeah, a lot more hyped up. 
Heck like, he's yeah. ready to fight Usman tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, Solomon, Solomon is 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 good. You know, like I I, I always manifest. No, I love you know? that kid. Uh, you know, Solomon's Solomon's one of my best friends. We're actually like you know he was telling telling me that he wanted to like find a place with me and move together. And I was like, dude, I don't know, man. <laughs> I was just like, I don't know if I could do with your energy. But uh, no, I love it. I love it. Cross that river into into New York. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know, man. I like, I'm always one to, to manifest things and, and say, you know, this is what I want to do. But right now, like, uh, I'm manifesting the fact that I want to get better and improve. And, and there's only up from here, you know. I know, I know that I'm, you know, I'm able to hang with those guys if we were working in the gym, right? I know for a fact. I, I see it every day. I see it every single day. I know for a fact I'll be able to hang with them. Um, and, and that just means that it's only up for me. So if it's only up for me, then everybody up there is fucked. That's it. And I, I know I know a lot of people have been questioning this because you stepped away once. You back mm-hmm. for good? I'm back for good. I'm back for good. I ain't no going more on. questions. You you good. No more questions. You know, I'm gonna make a serious push and if I if I decide that, that it's not for me ten years from now, maybe, maybe, but nah, man. I, I'm here for good. I, I need I need to play some punchy face. I love this shit too much, man. I love violence too much. I love I love every aspect of it. You gotta love that you're the only career in the world that you can say that out loud. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, the FBI be knocking on your door. You're like, "Excuse me, sir." Yeah. Did you say on on that, on that show that you love violence? Yeah, yeah, I love violence, man. This is just you know. We're talking about mixed martial arts people. Relax. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, I thought thought long and hard about what I wanted to do, and this is it. So I ain't fucking going nowhere. I'm here to stay. Well, good for you, man. I'm excited to see you back. I loved watching some of your amateur fights. I've been following you for a while. That's actually how I even found out about your music career because you posted that TikTok with uh, the Handsome Rob remix. I was <laughs> like, wait, what? And I started going back. I was like, oh, wait, he has more. Yeah. Oh, he's been doing this for a while. That's and then long. somebody mentioned the fifth floor and I, in a comment somewhere. And I was like, what the hell is the fifth floor? <laughs> and I looked it up. And sure enough, I think actually it was on the, like you posted the Teen Choice Awards like Instagram post. And yeah. I was like, what is this? And yeah. I go back and I look. I was like, "Oh, this is a real thing. This isn't just him messing around on TikTok. Like this was a thing. Real like, thing. <laughs> he he was a real singer. And so, yeah, I mean, that's a cool story though. Like a lot of people don't have like backstories and fun stuff. Like you talk about your childhood and this and that. And like, yeah, well, I toured around the world. How about you? Yeah, <laughs> got plenty. So, got plenty, but yeah, we'll definitely have to get you back on to have a little bit more of the of the boy band stories. That would be a fun time. Yeah, uh, I do. I do appreciate you taking the time today, man. Uh, telling people a little bit about your journey. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing more from you. Uh, definitely, uh, hopefully one day, one day soon, maybe we'll get you on Fighters First as officially licensed collection, get that Moose collection in the shop. I'm always pitching. People know that at home. I'm always pitching, always grinding. Uh, nice. You got you got to grow the brand, right? Got to grow the brand, man. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to June. Hopefully June will get you back in that cage, get you, uh, whether it's Ring of Combat, uh, Cage Fury. Real quick, uh, if you want to tell people at home, uh, or shout out any of your sponsors. Tell people at home uh, how they can follow your journey. Yeah, man. Uh, so you guys can follow me on my Instagram, the Moose Mooselia. Um, shout out to my sponsors, Alpha Fitness, Tiger Showman's Pro Shop, Made Meals. Um, you know, obviously my gym, my team. Love you guys. But uh, yeah, go hit that hit that like button, hit that follow button on my Instagram, the Moose Mooselia, and that's where you're gonna. Quick question: Who who is your main trainer over at Tiger? Because I know a lot of people. Some people train with Tiger. Some people train with Ron. Some people just like do a little bit of everything. Who's your main guy? Right now, it's it's Ron. Uh, Ron, Shannon. okay. That's that's my main guy. Um, he's been guiding me through. So that's him. Like I know Julio works a lot with 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 Tiger, and like it was always like I get a different answer every time. Yeah, I did. I did train very long time for Tiger, but the. Uh, since he stepped away and since I stepped away, I came back and Ron's been running, running the show a little bit more. So that's where I'm at. Does Tiger only really kind of step in for like the major, like, fight? yeah. Like, like when people are getting ready for a UFC fight. Yeah, pretty much. He's, he, he, uh, he steps in and I mean, he's been doing this for 30 years. He deserves it. <laughs> he deserves it. He's, he deserves it. So, well, shout out to Tiger Showman's, uh, and shout out to all your sponsors. Thanks for, uh, doing this episode, Justin, uh, look forward to hearing back from you soon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is unfiltered. That's the moose, Justin, uh, Muslia. Uh, make sure you follow him. He'll, you'll be knowing that name real soon. I'm sure. Uh, thanks for the time. This is unfiltered and we're out.